Coming up on Tech News Weekly, we talk to one of the people who's driving the case against Cambridge Analytica. Also, how voice prints are infiltrating the U.S. prison system, uh, what it means to be a digital minimalist, and we round out this year's Twit Switch. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 69, recorded Thursday, February 7th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Register a domain name and build your online brand with Hover. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. And by FreshBooks, the all-in-one cloud accounting solution helping small business owners thrive. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash TNW. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where each week we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. And uh, don't go anywhere because at the end of this episode, you're going to see two really happy hosts <laughs> handing back their devices. But we'll get to that a little bit mm -hmm. later. Uh, first up, with the pace of news these days, I personally, I wouldn't fault you uh, for possibly forgetting about that groundbreaking revelation from last year involving Facebook, your data, the election, and a company many may have never heard of prior to the blow up, Cambridge Analytica. But the battle for our data, of course, rages on. In fact, Netflix debut is a debut is debuting. Sorry, a new uh, documentary at the Sundance Film Festival. I believe they showed this last week called "The Great Hack," and it walks viewers through the scandal. And uh, among those featured in the film is our guest, David Carroll, a media professor at the Parsons School of Design in New York, who has been intimately involved in seeking justice through the British court system in the name of protecting privacy for voters and possibly for you. Welcome to the show, David. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It is awesome to have you here. We really appreciate you taking the time. So why don't we start with kind of where this all began? Why don't you walk us through how you got involved in a legal battle with Cambridge Analytica in the first place and why? Sure. So I'm a former tech entrepreneur myself. I had my shot at trying to make it big with data. And I definitely had that moment back in 2013, 14, where we connected Facebook to our app and realized we could not only see the user's data, but all of their friends' data. It felt really weird. Um, when the startup went bust, like most do, I felt enabled and empowered to um, kind of speak the the things that I had seen um, while learning how the sausage was made. Uh, I also teach uh, where students go into this industry. So my former students work at companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, uh, media companies, ad tech companies. And so it's always been my job to figure out how this industry works. And during the primary season, I was interested in how the campaigns were using advertising technology in new ways and the Cruise campaign was particularly aggressive in data collection. And that's when Cambridge Analytica first got on my radar. After the election, I was encouraged by a Swiss researcher to do what's called the subject access request, try to request our data, because the hypothesis was it was processed in the United Kingdom where we would have data rights. And so in January of 2017, I did the request. I received some data in March. Uh, and pu published that to Twitter and got some advice that it was probably not legal. And that's when I got myself a solicitor, which I didn't know what a solicitor was <laughs> before all this. And uh, we started to look at the legal challenges. And uh, there's lots to, to say about that. But needless to say, our original hypothesis was true. U.S. voter data was processed in the United Kingdom. And requesting that through the UK, like uh, from, from what I understood and from what I read, if you heard back that they were unwilling to give you that information, that would tell you one side of the story that it was isolated in the US. If they were, if they offered to give you something, which in, in essence, they gave you what you called a summary, then you knew that there was, there was some data transported over there. And that gave you a lot more strength for this case that you're going through now. That's exactly right. 
Ironically, if the campaign had not used a British company and our data had stayed in the United States, we would have no rights right. to ask for it or address anything about it. Hmm. So Wired called uh, what you're doing to get your data a quest. They called it a quest that was uh, epically nerdy. <laughs> did, <laughs> did you have any concerns or any idea that it was going to be this big when you started? Um, was this something that uh, that you knew was going to have all these ripples? When I first got the data back in March of 2017, I definitely had a visceral response um, that it felt big, but I didn't know exactly why or how. And then ever since then, it's been um, finding evidence that our anxiety around this is justified and our concerns about this are warranted. Um, so it, the part of the quest has been, you know, trying to achieve what the law allows for, and that's full disclosure. And then to understand the story about this and what it teaches us. So what is the, what is the teachable moment um, of this scandal? How is it going to inform both the industry and policy and d democracy moving forward? Um, so I think a lot is now to be learned about you know, talking to lawmakers as they consider new privacy legislation and and other things about how it affects our perception of our own democracy, which is really nicely depicted in the movie The Great Hack. Do you think, uh, I mean, I, I imagine your answer is yes, but uh, that the U.S. needs reform in this matter, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of disappointing uh, from the U.S. perspective that you actually had to kind of cross your fingers and hope that it could go in the direction, you know, that the data would be overseas in order to do anything about this. Do you think reform is around the corner? And are you, are you in, I, I don't know, um, uh, emboldened by what you're seeing as far as like this kind of tech reckoning that seems to be pointing us in that direction? Yeah, I never expected Cambridge Analytica to be a household name around the world. Uh, <laughs> so it started out a very nerdy thing. Yeah. Uh, but the reaction to it shows the anxiety bubbling beneath the surface. A lot of people don't know why they're upset about Cambridge Analytica, but they are upset. Um, and I'm figuring out exactly why. The California Consumer Privacy Act is a good example of how this has influenced U.S. lawmaking. One of the key things in the California law that comes into effect in the summer of 2020 is that people get rights to ask for the data that companies have on us. This is a, a sort of cornerstone of the European model and is the key thing that I realized the, um, um, the U.S. needs to grant what's called the right of access. You should be able to ask any company and organization to hand over the personal data they have on, o over you. Currently, that's not a requirement, and it seems to me a fundamental privacy right that Americans need to demand. And we have figured this out after the Cambridge Analytica catastrophe. Hmm. So, so you said that uh, as a professor, you teach a lot of students who um, go on to work at these big companies, Facebook, Apple, Google, or at least aspire to. Do you get the feeling that um, that this comes as a, what you're talking about, this I these ideas that, that companies should take better care of our data and also hand it over that it really belongs to us. Do Is that something they come into your classes already understanding or not? Uh, what's interesting is I teach a class called Dark Data where we really cover this stuff. And my students are very international. Um, my university is one of the most um, diverse in terms of international students. And so we have to look at not just the US model but the EU model, but also what's happening in India and especially China. And when you take a global view of how sort of there are at least four different models of privacy in the world um, and how they are different and how they are contrasting each other, this gives you a sense of um, sort of how the Internet is splintering. Um, and so it's it's important perspective to see the big picture and I think what's great is we have these important conversations where I have students from China debating the so-called Sesame social credit system with students from the U.S. and students from all over the world. And I think really the having this international conversation about these issues is really what's important. And it, and it influences their um, way of seeing things when they go in to work for these companies, which these companies are operating internationally as well. 
your students are lucky to have you. I mean, being so close to all this Cambridge Analytica uh, stuff that's going on and then to be able to pass that knowledge on to them and answer questions, they're super lucky to have you. Uh, last month, SCL Elections, which formerly Cambridge Analytica, pleaded guilty in the case uh, and faced penalties Although it should be, I mean, it's it was pretty obvious to me, and I'm sure it was to you too, that the penalties in the grand scheme of things were pretty paltry. Uh, what what was your take on that? So that prosecution happened in January, and that was the uh, regulator, the information commissioner, um, prosecuting them for failing to obey the order to disclose all my data. And the weird thing about it is they publicly, um, the administrators of the defunct companies said that they were going to plead not guilty. But then surprisingly, at the last minute, they pleaded guilty to everyone's surprise. And what's weird about that is that they then took on court fees, legal fees, et cetera, and costs. And if their primary motivation is to um, work for the creditors and the court and the former employees, why did they incur all these extra costs? It doesn't make sense in the case of bankruptcy and solvency. And one of the things that we're sort of figuring out now is, do we have rights as data creditors, meaning they owe us outstanding data, just like there are companies that are owed outstanding money? Um, so there's really interesting legal precedents being set. And uh, the story's not over even though a lot of people think it is. <laughs> well, so tell us about the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, that premiered at Sundance. Uh, I'm, you know, I was the first time I had ever seen it, uh, so it blew my mind. Um, I think people are going to really enjoy it. Um, it tells the story in an interesting way. It follows my story and the story of Brittany Kaiser. Brittany Kaiser is sort of the one of the lesser known whistleblowers. She worked at Cambridge Analytica really up to the end. And she's a very interesting character. Whistleblowers are very complicated people, of course. Uh, the other interesting thing about the film is it uses visual effects and motion graphics and graphics to tell the story and make what's an invisible world visible. And so I think a lot of people are going to go into the movie and have a much clearer understanding of the industry. I think that companies like Facebook and Google are going to be alarmed by how we so clearly explain their business model. Mm -hmm. And um, they've really appreciated the fact that their business model has been hard to understand. And the filmmakers have done such a good job of explaining it and then showing the risks to society accordingly. Does it also follow the story of Chris Christopher Wiley? Because that's the whistleblower that most people have heard of. Yes, uh, Christopher Wiley is is featured in the movie, um, but he did not sit for interviews. And I think we'll figure out why that's the case later on with other movies that c come out later. <laughs> with think, nudge, nudge. Part two. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, and that's that's a really great point, right? Like this story is not over. Uh, March 18th, 2019 is kind of the next step in in the evolution of this case. What happens then? Yeah, so March 18th is the sort of civil trial. It's really me as the plaintiff against the comp the, the administrators, uh, the defendants. Um, and that's where we're really challenging uh, the attempt to liquidate the companies. And do we have rights as data creditors? Can this company get away with liquidating without answering to its obligations? And so it's really where privacy law bumps up against bankruptcy law. Are we going to allow bad guys to just go out of business when they get caught? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, overall, uh, what's what's super inspiring to me in all of this is that you're kind of proving, you know, the, the adage that one person can make a difference, right? Like one person can decide to step up and kind of challenge this uh, this behemoth, uh, seemingly, you know, seemingly a behemoth. And then, you know, this has been a, a long journey for you, but you've you've made it work. And and you know, obviously, there's there's a, a documentary to kind of show show the machinations of that behind the scenes. What do you want people to learn from this? Like from watching what you've done from Cambridge Analytica, maybe, maybe more from a broader sense. Like uh, how are how are you able to pull it off where other people feel kind of helpless? I think the big lesson to learn is data rights are the new civil rights. Um, it's a it's a fundamental human rights issue. And I think the awareness of these things are helping people realize what that really means. And 
It also shows that when we do have the data rights laws, that it is possible to protect your rights. And you, you're, there are data cops on the beat looking for data crimes. And there are lawyers out there who want to defend their data rights. And so there's a general feeling of helplessness. There's nothing we can do. We're just resigned to being screwed over. But that's not true, especially when countries grant citizens rights to their own data. Yeah, absolutely. David Carroll, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. When, do we have a date as far as when the, the Netflix documentary is available to everyone to watch, or is it just sometime this year? Uh, I think they have a huge pressure to get it out as soon as possible. I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, But also they want to end it as definitively as possible. So I, I, I empathize with Netflix and the filmmakers because they want to get it out, but they also want to end it in a satisfying way. So yeah. I would say I estimate sometime in the late spring uh, would make sense to me. Right on. Well, I can't wait to watch it. Uh, David Carroll, thank you so much for hopping on. If, if people want to find you online and kind of follow your work and follow the story through you, how, how would you suggest they do that? Um, I'm very active on Twitter and I often post updates to the case right, right there for everyone to see. Awesome. And that's at Prof Carroll, uh, Prof for professor, of course. Uh, <laughs> David, uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much and best of luck with this case. Thank you for having me. Real Great pleasure. to share the story. All right. So coming up, uh, how voice printing is infiltrating the U.S. prison system. But first, let's take a break and thank the sponsor. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important. And buying a domain name for your passion is the first and many would say the biggest step to building your personal brand online. Keeping your domain name separate from hosting actually gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business because no one wants to be stuck with a solution that isn't meeting their needs. And who doesn't need a domain name? Nowadays, it feels like everyone has one. So it's important that yours stands out. And Hover can help you do that. Hover has over 400 domain extensions to choose from. Uh, Lately, you know, dot me, dot me. I feel like we've been hearing dot me. It's it's a really great personal profile uh, extension. Dot me is a unique extension to use for, say, if you have a portfolio online, you want to showcase who you are and what you do. It's a great way to go. Dot com. Everybody's heard dot com. Dot me tells someone. Oh, this is a site that's all about you. Uh, if you've got a portfolio website ready to launch, get the .me extension. That's just one of many extensions that you can find through Hover. Hover offers the best-in-class customer support team and no upsells, a clean and simple user experience and interface, a personalized email that matches your domain and that further supports your online identity, kind of keeps it all tied together. And the Hover Connect feature allows you to connect your domain name to many website builders with a few simple clicks. Hover just makes it all easy, makes it easy, and that's what you want. You don't want a complicated scenario in setting this up. It's also low cost. I love Hover. I've got domain names through Hover, and you should too. This year, find a domain name for your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year, and we thank Hover for their support of Tech News Weekly. According to a new report by The Appeal in partnership with The Intercept, prisons across the U.S. are using technology to digitize the voices of incarcerated people and then to enter them into large-scale biometric databases, sometimes without prisoners' knowledge or consent. Joining us to talk about this is George Joseph, the author of the report. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi George. Uh, so first, explain how prisons are acquiring people's voice prints. Sure. So what happens is prisons will get a contract with a company. Uh, in this case, our story focused on Securus that offers uh, voice recognition surveillance capabilities to prisons. And what happens is they do what's called an enrollment process where they either have um, people incarcerated speak certain phrases into a receiver at a phone station and an algorithm from Securus's um, program uh, it takes that data and creates a digital template um, to kind of create a unique vocal identifier for that person's voice. Um, all of the prison population is enrolled in this manner, and it creates thus a voice print database, 
which allows authorities to then identify um, who is on prison calls based on their voices. Um, a similar thing can happen to those who receive calls from prisoners as well. Their voices sampled and turned into a kind of digitized um, template that can allow prison authorities to identify who is speaking on the call. So you describe this uh, this story of, you know, a prisoner was told to, um, you know, before you are allowed to make a call, you have to repeat the, this list of terms or these things. And uh, and then they weren't allowed to make the, they weren't told why, and they weren't allowed to have their phone call if they didn't do it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the story that we focused on was uh, of a person incarcerated in New York, uh, the Sing Sing facility. But th this is a similar practice. This is happening all across the country in Pinal County, Arizona, for example, um, so that's generally how the enrollment happens. It's at intake, um, either when someone's brought in or for people who are already in the prison or just kind of lined up and said, uh, told to go say these phrases into the system. They're not told why, and they're not told about the long-term implications, of the surveillance that it would entail for them or the people they called, which can include their families, their loved ones, et cetera. It was a quote, uh, a quote in your article that stood out to me, just this idea that there are some people who are in the prison system that don't even know what Google, what a Google is, you know, let alone like being, being aware of the potential uses of their voice print, whatever a voice print is, you know what I mean? They've just been mm -hmm. out of, uh, out of that exposure to technology for so long that they wouldn't know. Is there anything illegal happening here or, you know, as, as far as obtaining these or being up front, like, or is, is that skirting uh, any sort of uh, laws or, or rules in place to protect, against, for, to protect prisoners? That's a good question. Um, generally what legal experts who focus on biometrics have said is that, it's not that it's legal or illegal. It's that there haven't the laws haven't caught up with the technology. Uh -huh. um, so we're kind of in a wild west scenario where departments of corrections across the country are acquiring this technology without any to little public notice um, information or uh, dissemination of notices even to the people in prisons or their families, and the, no laws have been created to kind of um, deal with and regulate these acquisitions. I think we're getting to a point where privacy is such a, a just, just a privilege, and it's often a privilege for the rich or like people who are not marginalized. Our last guest made a good point, said data rights are the new civil rights, which in this is sort of the same, the same thing. It's not uh, necessarily a person's data, but their biometrics. It's a similar, like there's these technologies that um, people start testing out with marginalized groups. And then we can expect that them to just all of us to uh, be accepting this sort of technology in the future. Is is that what you believe will happen at some point? If not, yeah, checked. definitely, uh, definitely. I mean, before this technology came to prisons, it was developed for military and counterterrorism purposes, and was used by U.S. government agencies, particularly intelligence agencies abroad, on populations that don't have any protections from U.S. law. Um, now it comes here to populations who, because of their criminal records, are kind of deemed to have less uh, due process rights. Um, but you could very easily see uh, a kind of interest from companies in the biometrics industry of further extending their markets to people who are in the criminal justice system or people who are suspected of potential you know, criminal activities and from there, the, the net just keeps widening. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing now. Um, for example, in this New York contract, like I mentioned, it's not just that uh, the person in prison's voice is being sampled. It's also that those who receive calls from them outside can have their voices sampled and then turned into a digital template and then searched across the prison call database to see who else they've been speaking with inside. So you see that net effect. It, it just reminds me of Facebook. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're friends with so-and-so. Okay, well, we connected you to so-and-so. Even if you don't have a profile, you've got a shadow account. So that's where we are with voice prints now. Mm -hmm. um, and you also, you, you point out in your article that an outside caller could be, like you said, could be identified via their own voice print as someone who is simultaneously talking or communicating with multiple prisoners. What, um, and, and that, that would be concerning. What makes that 
concerning? Like, what could be going on there? What are they? Th what are the dots that they're connecting there when they say, "Oh, wait a minute, this one person that we've identified is now talking to multiple prisoners." Well, you could see, um, for example, an investigation, let's say, into gang activity in which um, someone outside is coordinating a contraband um, kind of operation or some kind of potentially even violent plot that those things can and do happen in prisons. Um, you could also see on the other hand, um, activists on the outside who are often used as go-betweens for people incarcerated to help them coordinate information and logistical help for prison protests and kind of civil rights actions. And so the fact that these capabilities could use, be used for both those purposes um, but without any oversight or even knowledge from the public at large um, is worrying. worrying. Hmm. And so uh, your investigation has sparked a little bit of change. Tell us what's happened since you published your report. Well, after we briefed some um, New York State Assembly officials on our findings, they did uh, question the state prison officials at a hearing and um, unfortunately, I don't think the information, because our article hadn't quite been published yet, had gotten out enough to where they could really uh, grill them on what was going on. Um, basically, the uh, prison authorities' answers were fairly short and not um, fully explaining what processes had taken place. Um, but we do hope that this kind of um, attention that's been sparked by our article will push lawmakers to ask further questions and seek more transparency on this issue. What would you say are the differences between something that's an undisputed part of the mechanics of the legal system, which would be the fingerprint, you know, I mean, f fingerprints, you know, as, as a biometric sort of data point, it, like no one questions that everybody, everybody kind of assumes at this point, that's just part of the deal. Right. Um, do you think voice prints are, are next? How would, you, how would you compare those two? Or is it just the fact that they're going at getting these voice prints in such a, a roundabout sort of way that doesn't make sense? I think, um, I think voice prints are next in a certain sense, yes. Um, but there are differences in terms of um, the implications of that uh, future deployment because our voices appear in many, many forms of data sets in daily life in a ways that are very clearly collectible and analyzable um, in ways that our fingerprint traces aren't really um, at the same scale of. Um, so the amount of power that uh, large scale voice extraction and then recognition would enable whoever has it is at a scale that um, we haven't seen before. And it's the same with facial recognition. Yeah. It makes me think of, you know, about a decade ago when you used to be able to, remember, call, uh, like, information costs money when you, you 411, but mm -hmm. then Google had the free, um, was it Google 411? I can't it remember what it was. something like that, yeah. But then, yeah, yeah. like, you know, they they use, you would call up when, you know, you used to make actual phone calls and <laughs> ask for things. And they, Google used all of that, you know, to not, not you know, specifically, it wasn't targeted to me, but it was to test voices and voice yep. recognition software. And, you know, I've never felt that that was horrible because I, you know, I, I got it, I like voice recognition software. There was a, you, you got know, information. And, it, and it wasn't connected to me, but with, I mean, there's no, there, there's nothing with these voice press, you know, voice prints that has to do with anything as far as you know, besides just putting everybody's voices into a database so that they can track them later to make, you know, in case they commit a crime. Um, well, within the prisons themselves, there are um, applications that corrections officials are interested in. For example, if someone in the prison is threatened by another person uh, and kind of forced to give up their phone minutes, which are kind of a valuable currency in prisons um, because they don't have money and access to things beyond commissary, um, authorities do want to be able to detect uh those kind of um, unauthorized call patterns. Um, on the other hand, sometimes uh, people in prisons are making trades like that because they don't really have access to other forms of currency. And so, uh, you know, that kind of regulation is a tricky line. 
So the, you, you, this report was in on the appeal with The Intercept. I had heard of The Intercept, but I, the appeal is a new publication to me. What, what's the focus of the appeal? Yeah, the appeal is very new. I came on about eight months ago. Um, the focus of the appeal is to shed uh, light on county level police and prosecutor stories um, because the vast majority of prison admissions in this country are um, stemming from uh, county level kind of um, convictions. So we think that to really understand the criminal justice system, we have to understand these processes more at the local, county, and state level. So whereas a lot of people will focus on, you know, what Jeff Sessions was doing or private prisons at the federal level or drug uh, arrests at the federal level, we feel that um, more scrutiny, more public accountability, more investigations need to be done at the local level, particularly in light of the unfortunate decline of um, local news organizations across this country. Yeah, and community news is so important. Go to theappeal.org um, to see George's work. George Joseph is a reporter at The Appeal. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, George. It was fun. Thank you so much. I appreciate care. it. After the break, how to live like a digital minimalist. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by FreshBooks. Set new business goals and prepare for next year's tax season with FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software that puts you in control of your business. If you are looking at a mess of papers right now from last year's taxes and thinking you want to focus on your business and not spend so much time on your taxes, Check out FreshBooks. FreshBooks is full industry standard accounting for users of all levels, even if you're new to accounting. With FreshBooks, your financial health will no longer remain a mystery. Quickly generate and access accounting reports like the general ledger and balance sheet. And that's all in the FreshBooks dashboard. Send professional looking invoices in just seconds. See all your sent, your paid, your overdue, and your viewed. Yes, you can see all your viewed invoices. You can see if that person has looked at your invoice and not paid you, which is very useful. And you can get paid directly from your invoice in an average, it's, it's an average of two times faster. You can also create proposals with rich text content and images and request your client's e-signature. Automatically update expenses daily in bulk or all you have to do is simply upload a picture of a receipt and you can do it that way. It's very easy. There are many different ways to use FreshBooks. FreshBooks integrations further automate your workflow, acuity scheduling, PySync, MailChimp, Everlance, and so much more. Keep tabs on your business anytime, anywhere with the FreshBooks mobile app and the FreshBooks team is constantly adding new and improved features Thanks to user feedback, they recently redesigned the FreshBooks time tracking experience. Logging time for the week is much faster with each project getting its own line. The day sub tab now displays detailed entries with client, project, and service in list form. No more confusion regarding each block of time. Also, their support team is available 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and a video hub is available 24-7. Avoid the tax time scramble next year. Upgrade to FreshBooks for effortless invoicing and accounting. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash TNW and enter Tech News Weekly in the How Did You Hear About Us section. That's freshbooks.com slash TNW, and we thank FreshBooks for their support. The news on tech addiction has been rising. It's been a rising chorus for a while now, but just in the last year, the people questioning our overuse of technology are often the people who understand the technology the most. One of those voices is Cal Newport, professor of computer science at Georgetown University and author of the new book, Digital Minil Min Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. So. Your new book was released this week, but you've been working on this idea of the importance of focus for a while now. Talk a little bit about when you first started getting interested in this idea, uh, the importance of just being more focused. Well, as a, an academic computer scientist, uh, and in particular, a theoretician, throughout all of my training, I had been exposed to people who took concentration very seriously. This was a primary skill, and what they did was being able to stare at a whiteboard and try to solve a theorem. Now, somewhere around 2014, when I, when I first began working on my last book, Deep Work, is when I began to notice as I researched more that focus is not just important for eccentric computer scientists like me who stare at whiteboards, but was becoming a tier one skill in the knowledge economy in general. 
And so you uh, you recently wrote a piece in the New York Times uh, called "Steve Jobs Never Wanted Us to Use Our o iPhones Like This." Um, what? Uh, how did he want us to use them? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> Well, I mean, Steve Jobs is a, was a minimalist, and to him, he liked to take activities that were meaningful and try to make the experience even better, right? So if you go back and talk to, as I did, some of the original engineers involved with the original iPhone development or watch Steve Jobs' original keynote address at Macworld in 2007, it's pretty clear that the goal for the original iPhone was twofold. One, to build the best iPod they had ever built. And two, to combine that iPod with the best phone that had ever, ever been built. It, it takes about 30 minutes into his keynote address before Jobs even really talks about internet connectivity or apps. And as the engineer I talked to confirmed, Jobs really saw this as a, uh, a phone that was also an iPod and it made both of those experiences really good. So he was trying to take things that people already really liked, making phone calls and listening to music, and bring those experiences to the next level. He never had in his mind this notion that it would become a constant companion that you were checking all day long, like an air traffic controller, you know, fiercely taking in information, sending the information out. He wasn't trying to change the way we lived. He was just trying to take things that we really enjoy and make those experiences even more enjoyable. Yeah, it seems to me uh, that the turning point from kind of like the Steve Jobs, m m let's say, minimalist approach, minimalist compared to today's standards anyways, of what you would do with an iPhone into uh, this like digital companion role was the the kind of introduction of the App Store. And, you know, once once the App Store happened, everybody had a reason, you know, to create something that they could put in front of you and get you to use it all the time. Would you kind of agree that was like the, the big the big turning point? And is there any way to turn back around? Well, the, the App Store opened the door. And you know, Jobs was very worried about the App Store at first, mainly yeah. because he thought that third-party apps would be inelegant and not use the features well and maybe crash the phone at, at, at uh, bad, bad times. Um, but what really shifted the phone into the constant companion mold was when the major social media platforms, and in particular Facebook, who was early to this, needed to get those revenue numbers up. They had to get the revenues up, numbers up for their IPO, and this is where they really began to re-engineer the social media experience so that it became something in which you were getting this constant stream of social approval indicators that made it very difficult to resist compulsively clicking on the app. So the apps gave us a lot more to do on the phone, but it was social media doing attention engineering that I think really pushed us into our current world where we can't look away from the screen. Mm. Yeah, so there's really two parts to this. What You know, that kind of... Um, I. I it, I want attention. I want people to like all my stuff. And so I keep, um, you know, going back to the device and losing attention. How can I stop this? You have the 30 day, I, I have your book right here. You have the 30 day uh, <laughs> digital declutter. Um, what, what, give us a high level of, of what that is. I need it. <laughs> well, I think when it comes to digital technology in our personal lives, we essentially need to start from scratch, right? We've just ended this 10 year period that maybe begins with the iPhone, which was uh, a lot of exuberance and excitement around all these new technologies. We signed up for things haphazardly. A lot of the experiences that we signed up for were re-engineered at some point to become more addictive. And so what I'm recommending is that people step back, clear all this clutter out of their digital life, and then rebuild it from scratch much more intentionally. Say, okay, let's start over. What do I really care about? What do I actually want to spend time on? And now, how do I intentionally deploy technology to help these things that, that really matter, right? That's the minimalist approach to technology, as opposed to the maximalist option, which is just, if there's any case that this could be useful or convenient, I should probably download it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or yeah, if I the, the notifications, that's my thing. It's like, oh, yeah, I guess I should allow notifications because I, I might want them someday. But really, I should go the other way and turn them all off and turn them back on if I really need them. Yeah, but I go even farther and say, delete it all. Like, so the 30 days is take it all off for 30 days. Clear your palate. Like, get rid of the compulsive use to, to use the phone. And then after the 30 days, say, okay, what do I want to add back? And be very intentional when you do it. So digital minimalists, for the most part, they use tech to great advantage, but they use a lot less <laughs> than most other people are doing. And so they're looking at their screens a lot less and tend to be enjoying their life a lot more. They're just a lot smarter about their relationship with technology. 
So I completely, um, I completely understand, and I adopt you know certain aspects of what you're talking about as far as returning to more of a a real world life. Realizing that over the years I got super consumed with my social media and keeping it all up to date, and then realizing I was just distracting myself to death. Um, but what if real world life is actually transforming and we're and in doing this we're actually kind of more putting our head in the sand than we are kind of moving with the the kind of the, the stream move, moving with the flow of the way things are well i mean i've heard this storyline before that essentially this constant companion model where we're constantly looking at a screen and more of our life is mediated through a virtual world that somehow this is just fundamental to what it means to live in the 21st century but if you look deeper at it, you know, where did this behavior come from? Who is it benefiting? It becomes pretty clear that there's nothing fundamental about this. In fact, a large portion of this behavior of constantly looking at, this, at the screen is just basically a mechanism to alchemize our time and attention into stock price. And so I'm a big believer that a lot of what we're doing now that's starting to make people uneasy is recent and arbitrary. For the most part, a lot of it's not in the interest of the user. And we have a lot more flexibility to reimagine our relationship with these tools than we suspect. So I don't think what we're seeing now is the first step in an evolution towards a new type of digital uh, uh, existence. I think what we're seeing now instead is a period of initial exuberance where we probably went too far and companies probably got too aggressive about trying to monetize us from which we're going to regress back towards a much more sustainable mean. Yeah. You're the second uh, college professor we've talked to in the show. And I'm going to ask you the same <laughs> question I asked him, which I now realize probably everyone asks you this because we all want to know, you know, the children are our future. But <laughs> when you see students coming in, are they, do, are you seeing a change in attention spans or are they actually more aware of the idea that our attention is a commodity and, um, you know, especially if we're going into computer science, we need to take better care of it? Both things are happening. So Generation Z, which is this first generation to have access to smartphones and social media starting in the early adolescence, they're getting hit really hard by this. And we see this most strikingly in the mental health statistics, where we see this very sharp hockey stick-like rise in the graph of anxiety and anxiety-related disorders, as well as accompanying hospitalizations for self-harm and suicide attempts. This goes right up as soon as social media and smartphones are uh, available at a young age. So uh, this has been a problem for young people. But the thing I'm hearing from these same young people is that they know this. And there's almost like a revolt that's beginning to emerge from the bottom up because they're so savvy. They're not that happy with this idea that, you know, these three executives are manipulating all of their time and attention to try to keep them using Snapchat or keeping Snapchat streaks alive or whatever it is that's keeping them glued to their phones and away from real life. And so I'm sensing that there's a real hunger out there among young people for something different. They know that it's a problem. They know that they're getting hit harder than other people because they don't have a memory of life before these things like the rest of us do. But we have this shift that's happened the last few years where they're starting to notice that. And so we have this sort of emergent result starting in people's teenage years where they're saying, I'm not so sure about me being in my room with this screen all the time as if this is what I really want to do. So I'm a little bit optimistic about seeing some change here. Nice. I like, hear I like hearing you say that. Um one one of the things in your book, one of the things that you spend some time on is is this idea of leisure time, of kind of like me time, right? Like like blocking everything out, actually giving yourself the moment to uh, to be silent and and be one with yourself, and to have actual true leisure time. And what struck me about that was just this idea that I, I think a lot of a lot of people would look at technology and they would define leisure time around that, right? Like they would say, well, that is my leisure time. My leisure time involves technology. What would you say to that? Well, something I discovered researching the book is that we have a real need as humans for what I call high quality analog leisure. So activities, typically activities that require some sort of actual skill, something you get better at as the skill gets better, that also involves you interacting with the real world around you. Right. This is what our brain has evolved to expect is that we manipulate the world, let's say, with our hands and our intentions are manifested concretely. This is a huge source of satisfaction. It's, it's a big part of human flourishing. And if you replace this all with digital leisure activities, you're at a large loss. There's something fundamental about the concrete world that our mind has learned to expect. It's what we've evolved to want to try to manipulate. And it, we do not understand lights moving on a screen in the same way that we understand picking this thing up, 
chipping the thing off the rock, making the spear, being able to throw the spear, seeing it going into the Mastodon, those sort of proverbial caveman activities. And so I've been a big advocate for getting high quality analog leisure back into your life, not allowing the digital stream to eat up every last free scrap of leisure time that you have. And when the people I've worked with have made the shift, their quality of life, their self-reported quality of life has really gone up. Mm -hmm. So you're in Georgetown, uh, you know, very close to in DC. Uh, do you think that regulation has any part in this or is this really just like a, a personal choice in how we change our own lives or should the companies be regulating this or should the government be regulating this? Well, I'll say uh, I don't take that option off the table, but I'm yet to see a proposal for regulation that's going to have the type of sweeping effect that I think we need. And so at the moment, at least until until I hear something that seems like it's a better idea, I think our best shot for trying to actually increase the quality of life uh, in our culture is probably going to be cultural changes. I think as people step back and say the constant companion model of smartphone use is not fundamental to our current technological age. It's not fundamental to how we live. It's not fundamental to extracting the most value out of modern innovations. It is an arbitrary contrivance that helps a small number of companies make more money. I think our culture understanding that and stepping back and saying, OK, I am now going to treat tech tools like I treat any other tool I own something I deploy to help me with things that I really care about. If we can make that shift, we're going to have huge positive changes. And I don't see how we get there uh, with any sort of uh, legislation alone. It's so interesting because like, a, you know, two decades ago when I started or more in technology, it was the idea was like to teach kids that technology is a toy. Like when it's a tool, you'll never get them to love it. Like you'll never turn, you know, your child into a computer scientist if they're just looking at these as tools. They need to look at them as toys. But now it's sort of flipped. The idea really is flipped. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Now, Cal Newport is an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University and the author of six books, including Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Nosy World, Noisy World. <laughs> well, you know what? It's pretty nosy as well. Let's yeah. be honest. The data brokers are very nosy. Uh, it was released this week by Penguin Random House. Um, and I always thank people for their time, but I want to especially thank you for your time because I know that you're so mindful of who you give it to. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Cal. <laughs> All right. The story of the week mm -hmm. this time around is one that Megan and I have been writing for right around a month now. We've been writing furiously, right? Mm -hmm. It's Twit Switch 2019. If you recall back on episode 65, Megan handed her iPad Pro with a keyboard dock over to me. And I handed my Pixel Slate, with the Slate keyboard, over to her. We wanted to see how the tablet and keyboard experience compared between the two devices. I know for a fact that I'm incredibly comfortable working with that device over there with Chrome OS. <laughs> I also know that you love your iPad. Uh, so before we make our way back to home where we're familiar, <laughs> let's talk about our experiences living life on the other side. Um, who wants to go first? Do you want me to go first or? Uh, I can go first. Okay, you go first. I have a, I have some thoughts. My biggest takeaway with this is that a lot of us in the, um, you know, Mac iOS world, we talk about, oh, wouldn't it be great if, you know, there were just one, if it was just iOS, if everything was iOS or, you know, where, oh, I'm always tapping the screen of my MacBook and I just want one um, one operating system, having working on a Mac and an iOS, but that is much more complicated. That's my biggest takeaway from that because this is, uh, it's not an Android device and it's not a Chrome device. It's not, you know, I don't know what it is and I don't think it knows what it is. And especially when you're talking about uh, apps, I think, I mean, at first I was trying to download everything from the Google Play Store yeah. and I was getting the Twitter app and I was, you know, getting all these apps. And then you said, you know, I don't really use those. I don't use apps. No. I just no. use everything on the web. And then I thought, well, then why would you do that? At the same time, like this is a full functioning web browser, which is great. And the iPad, iOS does not have that. So I do really like that. But then there is just this I and mean, it's Google's problem in general. It's that there's so many options. Yeah. There's so, like there's too many options because you actually can use the Google Play Store to get apps for to get Chrome apps for your Pixel. Like it, you know, it says where do you want to download it, and it's um, you know on your Pixel. But then there's also if you go to the Chrome 
web store. That's really extensions. That's、mm-hmm. not apps.、Mm-hmm. Then there's this whole other world.、Um, I mean, I almost feel like talk to me when you can. When you've got this under control. Because, like, there's. <laughs> That'll there's, never happen. <laughs> well, there's、Welcome、the app service. Like, that's another thing. App service, which is the way that, that Google thinks they're going to combine all this.、Um, yeah. I. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. But I mean, functionally, like the, the hardware is great. And I think I'm not the first to say that. Like, it's great that there are two、uh, USB C ports you can charge and, you know, listen or do, you know, do, you can do two things at once. You know, connect it to a bigger monitor、mm-hmm. and charge. That's what I do.、Um, I do like the keyboard and I like the way, you know, it, you can have all these different、um, angles. That's very nice. Um, Yeah, I,、uh, there, there's some things great about it, but the software, I just, I just don't think it's, it's having an identity crisis, and I don't want to be part of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I mean, I would agree with you that Chrome OS has an identity crisis. I think, that, I think that the inclusion of Android apps in Chrome OS was something that people were asking for, and I think it's, it's neat that Google was able to pull it off. I don't know that it necessarily solved a lot of the, a lot of the kind of scenarios that people who were asking for it. Necessarily wanted. It's certainly not the first place to go because, as you experience, when you put apps on there, like it doesn't make anything easier.、Mm-hmm. It's, it just kind of makes things more complicated and weird and looks strange and everything like that. Yet the paradigms are crossed. And when you get one, you, you know, you, Possibly already know that it does run Android apps.、So、you're like, so just think of the utility of this device. It does both things.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does that. But, you know, probably in most cases, you're better off going to the website than you are the Android app because it just, and especially kind of working in tablet mode. I don't know. Like, I, I completely understand what you're saying.、Mm-hmm. But, you- I, but I love working with it in Chrome, like as a Chrome browser, as just a desktop kind of environment. I think it's great. But it's very expensive for that. I mean,、it、you、is. could get a Chromebook that's like one third of the price. One four, one, I don't know. I mean, just. You、yeah,、can. don't Chromebooks like cost $5 or something? Yeah, basically. <laughs> But I mean, I've used a lot of those Chromebooks too. And those are Chromebooks that I would not live with、yeah. because, you know, the trackpad is, feels、right. cheap and、mm-hmm. the keys are not ideal and it doesn't have a touch screen. Th- this is expensive. But if I'm going to live in the Chrome OS world, I guess I just have expensive tastes. Like, I like that hardware enough、mm-hmm. that I would use that.、Mm-hmm. And that, that, that expense, yes, it's expensive, but it's, it's what I would need in、mm-hmm. order to live in, in the Chrome OS world. Yeah.、Um, yeah. So I guess those are my thoughts. I'm just、yeah. I'm excited to get my iPad back because there's a lot of apps that I just like、um, to use、mm-hmm. um, on a tablet. And, I, and you're used to kind of working in that tablet environment and、mm-hmm. using those apps. That's one thing that I learned, like one of the big takeaways that I learned in using the iPad Pro and not having the slate is that I have such little need in my life for a tablet. Like, I just really don't need a tablet. <laughs> what, I, what I use and what I'm used to using and need is the phone that I have in my pocket. And I use that less and less, it seems like these, these days, and some sort of a, a, like a productivity style device. And in this case, it, right now, it happens to be the slate. But there was somebody on Twitter who was it? I can't remember who it was,、uh, who, who put out a tweet. And I think you even responded to it、um, from Android Police who said,、uh, you know, don't at me. Like, the, the Pixel Book is better. Than the、uh, Pixel s l a t e Yeah, it, it, yeah. Yes, it was David Ruddick. Thank you. And when I thought about that, I was like, yeah, but I use both and I'm happy to use both. But really, at the end of the day, the Pixel Book is, is great. Like,、mm-hmm. it's actually the solution I need because I don't need the tablet. And so, working inside of the tablet of the iPad Pro, it was, I, I felt like so much of it was just kind of lost on me because、mm-hmm. I was like, well, I don't need it for that. I need it for this. But I, I saw you using the coloring book apps. Yeah, I was using the coloring book apps. You were drawing you know, during I, a meeting. I felt like I, I needed to,、uh, to get in there with the pen. I really like that it docks up there on the top and、mm-hmm. snaps in and starts charging. That's really. That's kind of like nice and magical. You know what I mean? At least it doesn't dock like that. No.、Uh, Did you download any music creation <laughs> apps or anything? Did you play? I, well, I. Oddly enough, I have an iPad, an older iPad at home that I use with the Spire. If you,、mm-hmm. if you remember a couple of years ago, there was the little Spire. It's like a little digital multi track thing,、mm-hmm. and you can control it on the iPad. That's like one of the only reasons I have the iPad. And actually, now they have an Android app, but it's not as good as the iPad app, which kind of is, you know, the. The thing that you, that I as an Android user run into time and time again is、mm. that apps are intentionally made for a tablet 
on the iPad. Mm -hmm. Apps are not intentionally made hardly ever for a tablet on Android. Mm -hmm. And it all and it always feels that way. You know, even on the the slate when you get yeah. an Android app and you go full screen with it, it doesn't feel like it was made to be like that. Mm -hmm. You can do it, but it doesn't feel like it was tailored for that. Mm -hmm. And I will totally give iPad the the big thumbs up in that regard. Apple has done a really great job to s support and foster the tablet environment. Uh, and to encourage developers to create for it, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's a lot of people that, that love and, and thrive in that iPad tablet, uh, environment. And so developers will follow mm -hmm. that can't be said about Android. That's true. You know? So you didn't kick back with a little Donut County or Monument Valley or any of the other games for No, because iPad? I can play those. I can play those. I can play Monument Valley. I don't know about Donut County. You, you didn't tell me about Donut County. <laughs> Maybe it isn't on Android, but I can play Monument Valley. Oh, um, Monument Valley's on Android? Yeah. Oh. And part two. Oh. Both of them. Okay. <laughs> so next time you got the slate, you could download it for do right what now. reason, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, it's a great lean back experience. Uh, like I said, the pen was a lot of fun to work with, I did, but not from a uh, productivity angle. It was just more like, hey, you know, drawing with it is kind of fun. Um, I got really used to the gestures, mm -hmm. kind of swiping between. At first when I got it, I felt all lost. I couldn't like go back and forth and multitask very well. I got really comfortable with that. Uh, the keyboard, I don't know if it's easy to see on the table, but the, the keyboard attachment, if you put it sideways, um, on the slate. I mean, the slate's a little bit larger than this iPad in mm -hmm. particular, but the keyboard is l way less lappable, mm -hmm. you know, as like a air quotes laptop. Yeah. that The Pixel Slate is a little bit harder. It's going to fall yeah. off the edge of your knees. Right. And I will definitely say, you know, that this attachment on the iPad is a little bit uh, less deep Mm -hmm. And so it actually works in that regard. Um, and, you know, I like the the apps and we kind of already talked about that. Um, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, I I realized going into this that this really isn't comparing apples to apples, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is that is a productivity setup. It's designed for it. This is a tablet with app support, which is really great. That can be a productivity device. But I think anyone that says oh, it's just as good as any other productivity device is smoking crack because it's not. You can do that. You can get there, but it's going to slow you down. Yeah. And unless you're OK with that, like you will be slowed down. And it, that was too slow for me. Right. I could not real run my life off of this as much as I tried. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I agree with that too. I, I think those people, uh, I, I don't know about their crack use. So I, I can't That's say That's true. I way. don't really know. But I do know that for <laughs> them, that. Uh, if they are writers, they usually have been using a, a an app designed for- totally. Um, like they've found the perfect app that they just love and they've been using it for a while and now, you know, everything's powerful. Or if they, you know, are musicians or they, you know, yeah. they they have this one app that they've been using for a while and it, yeah, and that that's what they use most of the time. And, right. And yeah. I mean, I'm coming at it from the opposite, right? Like everything we do here at Twit is all built around Google yes. apps. Yeah. And sure, like, you know, I've got the doc here. Like I, yeah. I would say that this iPad was really great. I mean, it was fine for running shows. Yeah. But for creating shows, yeah, heck no. Like yeah. I tried that multiple times and right. all it did was slow me down and give me pain, you yeah. know? And that's because my choice is to use Google Apps because that's what we use here. Yeah. If I had uh, had the flexibility to go into Apple's, you know, mm -hmm. first party, you know, developed for the iPad solutions that are similar to the Google Apps suite, um, you know, I'd probably be talking a different story, but yeah, they that don't just have doesn't any match my use case. Right. They don't have any first party. They're all third party. There's no, like nobody uses, I mean, I'm sure there are people out there they that use like pages. pages. And, yeah. I don't know anyone who uses them <laughs> regularly. But they um, have it, I guess. But yeah, I think when I'm using Google Sheets on the iPad, I feel like, gremlins like the kitchen in gremlins where they're all like throwing everything around yeah. and you know just like that's exactly my thought because all of a sudden some you know you're something will go awry or you'll delete Boop. everything or where did you know that it's bar just go? and I, yeah. and the reason why I imagine gremlins because I feel like someone's doing it on purpose I don't know if that's Apple or Google <laughs> and I'm sure you know but that someone's like I'm just gonna mess up this experience um for you so you know it's not a perfect experience on the the iPad but yeah those yeah. those are my feelings about and so that was a pleasant surprise to be able to use um, Google Sheets and Google Docs so seamlessly on a tablet. Yeah, because it's tablet. just like your laptop. Yeah. Did you ever use it in tablet mode? I did sometimes, yeah. Like I tried to, yeah, watch stuff and 
Um, I didn't have a pencil, so I couldn't draw or color. Um, it's okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I used it a little bit um, as on tablet mode. And it's also, I also have been using um, the uh, the Microsoft Surface, mm-hmm. too. Like, I've used the Surface Book, and then now um, I'm using a regular Surface. And that's sort of the same thing. It's that kind of in-between, yeah. you know, is this... Uh, like what? What is it to have just one operating system, not a tablet operating system, and a you know, mm-hmm. and because I mean, in some ways, Apple really has three. Like the iPad, the gestures are getting more similar than the iPhone, but for a while there, it felt like three operating systems, right. different gestures on the iPhone, the iPad, and your computer. And so, yeah, um, I'm glad to be done with it, and I'm glad that we didn't switch phones because that's uh, I I'm sure the Pixel is great, but the feelings we all always have after that is just, it's just messed with our routine yeah, in a way totally. to use each other's phones. Totally. So this was, a, this, I mean, this messed with our routine in a different way, yeah. but, but I'm, I, but I'm, I'm happy that we did it because I've always kind of wondered, and I've seen the people on social media who, who are so dedicated to using the iPad and seeing, being like, Hey, see, I can use it for everything. Mm-hmm. I don't need another computer. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right. They're using apps that they are very used to that accomplish the things that they need to. Uh, and I just, I wasn't using those apps, so I didn't mm-hmm. have that experience. So I should take it back. I'm sure it's possible to be as productive as you need to be on the iPad. I just couldn't get there based on what I use yeah. and what I need. So there we go. Uh, We're not going to do it this very second, but we're going to trade devices back after the show. We have to, you know, kind of like wipe them. I don't think you want to be me for the next uh, 11 months on your iPad, right? Mm, (laughs) Although that would be be interesting. (laughs) Uh, We'll see. And we are going to appear on each other's shows. Yeah, we can. Yes, Yes. absolutely. We can talk about this uh, from more of a deeper experience and, and get the other guests on our shows to question us right yeah deeper yeah mm-hmm. so uh, we'll uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll see that coming up soon tech news weekly records live every thursday starting at 11 a.m pacific at twit.tv slash live you can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv i know some of you watch live and that is amazing we love having you in the chat room but we also want you to subscribe to our show so go to twit.tv slash TNW and you can find all the ways to subscribe. Uh, if you don't want to do that, just open up whatever you use for podcasts. We um, are everywhere. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Pocket Cast, Overcast. We're on Spotify. So fi- you can find us on Spotify. And you can also follow us on our socials, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, all the socials. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Real quick, just to let you know, twit.to slash survey19. If you want to do a survey, we're doing a survey right now uh, to get an idea of what you like, what you don't like, things that we're doing right, wrong, whatever. Anything that you have uh, that you can kind of feed us your information as far as how we're doing as a network, uh, as the Twit Network. That's twit.to slash survey19. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who helps us do the show each and every week. Uh, Josh, Jammer Bees taking pictures and helping out. Uh, Burke, of course. So many people help us do the show. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you too. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on another episode of Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody.